Dear Mr. Saura Alec, dear Minister, dear Mr. Snyder, dear Madam Rychnovská, Madam Rector, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure and honor to welcome you here at the Czech Embassy. Today's event is another result of the successful cooperation between the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the IVM. Uh, the new world is over. Currently, social and political challenges is the topic of our today's discussion. I am very happy to welcome here the Czech Ministry of Culture, Mr. Lubomir Zauralek, as one of the discutants. Mr. Zauralek is currently visiting Vienna and he is a long-standing supporter of the Institute activities. It was while he was the Minister of Foreign Affairs, then the cooperation between the Czech Republic and the IVM was signed. Uh, it is a special pleasure for me to welcome Mr. Timothy Snyder, who will join Mr. Zauralek in this discussion. Mr. Timothy Snyder is not only a world-known author and historian, but also one of the Mr. Zauralek favorite thinkers. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the two gentlemen will be joined by today's discussion by the excellent Czech scientist Dagmar Rychnovská. And we are very grateful to the IVM for the outstanding uh, support and efforts in Vienna and elsewhere. Especially I would like to give recognition to the efforts of Dr. Ludger Hagedorn, who is <laughs> here, is sitting behind, who has been... <laughs> okay, Ludger, you are sitting <laughs> behind all the people, okay. And who has been instrumental in giving concrete shape to our cooperation. Uh, it has become a part of our good cooperation and a uh, great tradition that we meet every autumn to discuss uh, actually and currently social and uh, political issues. And I hope that today's discussion will not only contribute to uh, understanding today's challenges and uh, maybe or to see the future possible development. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a pleasant and inspiring evening. Thank you. I won't uh, stand between you and our distinguished guests. I just want to say a very, very warm word of thanks, extend a warm welcome to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, but to thank especially uh, Mr. Saralek for his continued support for not only the Institute, but for initiating this particular program of cooperation with fellowships. These are the Patochka fellowships, which bring Czech intellectuals to the Institute, also bring some of our distinguished guests from abroad to Prague to uh, very many public events. What I would like to do is to extend a very warm thanks to my other colleagues. So I need to thank Ludger Hagedorn, of course, but I need to go back maybe one step and thank Klaus Nellen, who is sitting next to him, who is hiding also, he likes to hide. But I want to mention him very particularly because the entire association with uh, Czechoslovakia and um, then, of course, later the Czech Republic is through the Patochka archives, which the Institute housed, and this is a very particular personal achievement of my colleague uh, Klaus Nellen. So thank you on our behalf to my two um, colleagues here and of course it's a great pleasure to have Tim Snyder uh, with us and have him uh, here uh, this evening and my great warm very heartful thanks to you, Ambassador Genevankova, for having supported us through so many different events 
coming to you with all kinds of small and large problems to be solved. And it's been a great pleasure to have you as an intellectual partner in this endeavor. So very many thanks to you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is also my great pleasure to welcome uh, here our two distinguished guests, which have been uh, so warmly introduced. Uh, thank you also for the, for the welcome to the Madam Ambassador and the President of the Institute of Human Sciences. Um, as has been already announced, today uh, we are talking about a new world disorder, current political and social challenges. And uh, I think uh, given what has happened in the past few months, uh, there are many topics to, <laughs> to definitely discuss. And I'm very interested uh, to hear what our speakers think about how the perception of political and social challenges has actually uh, changed over the course of these past months and what are the implications thereof for the upcoming years when we are probably uh, to face new challenges or the ones that we have uh, maybe somehow underestimated uh, so far. Uh, the way our, uh, we would like to organize this evening is that we will hold a discussion between these two uh, distinguished speakers uh, for approximately 15 minutes or one hour, and then we would open the floor uh, for the audience to ask questions to our speakers. So uh, please, if you have questions, start thinking about them, and then there will be room for them uh, and you'll be able to talk about, uh, to, to raise your questions on a microphone, which will then circulate in the, in the room. So don't worry, there will be room for audience as well. <laughs> um, let me start with the, with the most obvious, <laughs> and that is, the, that is the corona crisis, which I believe is not only uh, health, uh, issue, but the more complex societal and political issue. We have seen that Corona crisis has halted many discussions and processes uh, in the past months and fueled others, uh, such as on social inequalities, as experienced by many of us directly under the lockdown and uh, in, in healthcare. And many people have in these past months gone through a period of very increased anxiety, uncertainty, and maybe also fear what is going to happen. Now, I'm wondering, how do you think that this personal experience with insecurity, and insecurity coming from a very uh, globalized processes, uh, affected what citizens, what people actually want from the state? Now, Professor, Professor Snyder, talks about uh, this issue uh, in his new book, Our Malady, where he uh, addresses uh, the pr how citizen going, thr going through um, intense um, uh, health crisis experiences the whole uh, uh, healthcare system and reflects as a very reflexive uh, citizen indeed and patient, uh, reflects on its shortcomings and problems. And on the other hand, Mr. Zauralek has certainly experienced this from the perspective of a policymaker who is, <laughs> who is faced with the new demands from, from the public. So I'm wondering if you may uh, talk briefly about what do you think that citizens want from the state after the corona crisis experience? <laughs> so I will, I will talk around the question until I get close to it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it, it so coming, coming from America, a, a, a very elemental issue of controversy is the, the truth itself. So one thing that citizens, or at least some citizens, want from their government is to be told the truth. And the truth doesn't appear on its own in the wild. The truth is something that human beings have to purposefully work for. And in the case of the coronavirus, you have to purposely work for some kind of a system in which human beings can be tested. Uh, in Austria, I realize that's 
selbstverständlich. Um, I'm sure you all got tested this morning after you brushed your teeth. Um, but in the United States, our leading politician questioned the inherent value of knowledge. Or to put it more strongly, he, he conflates knowledge about the disease with the disease itself. So Mr. Trump's case is that if you don't test, then there is no disease, which is a perfectly coherent, pre-enlightened view of the world. And so one issue that's contested is, do citizens have a right to basic knowledge about themselves, uh, the knowledge which will enable them to live or die? Um, it's not putting it too dramatically to say that conservatively 100,000 Americans would, would be alive right now if that issue about truth and factuality had been settled earlier in, in my country. A second, a second question is um, the ability to have human contact, which one sees in my country, at least on both the right and the left, in different ways. People on the right are protesting against wearing masks. They're protesting against quarantines. They're protesting ag against lockdowns, which, although I disagree with it, is, of course, humanly understandable. And when they say that there's, a, that there's an issue of freedom here, they're, of course, correct. And then on the left, um, there is, and this is something I personally am quite sympathetic with, there is the observation that isolation and digitalization go together and that in fact the coronavirus epidemic is actually not a dystopia from the point of view of Silicon Valley, but actually a utopia from the point of Silicon Valley, because now we finally have all these humans sorted out from one another, and in an almost perfect digital environment where we can classify them and data farm them as thoroughly as we possibly could. So another thing which humans on both the right and the left might want from their government is the ability to gather sensibly. And this feeds nicely into uh, Mr. Zawadlik's new responsibility, which is culture. Um, the, the, the third thing that, and this relates, the third thing that I've noticed that people, especially in the US, want not so much from their government, but as a right vis-a-vis -vis their government, is the right to protest. So the, in, in, we had an election in the state of Wisconsin in the spring, um, which really should not have happened because the, the disease conditions were so awful, but the local authorities let it happen on the logic that they were trying to actually suppress the vote. So you, I mean, for those of you who are novices in American politics, there are two parties in my country. There's the voter suppression party and there's the other party. So the, the, the I would like to record uncomfortable laughter in, in the embassy. <laughs> so the, the, um, the, voter su the voter suppression party wanted that election to go forward on the logic that fewer people would vote. Um, and in fact, people massively voted, um, basically as a matter of protest, literally risking their lives in order to cast a vote. At, with Black Lives Matter, one has to be very, very careful about this because, of course, Black Lives Matter is fundamentally about the basic civil right of Americans to be treated like other Americans. But there is a component, which I could feel myself, of people wanting to show their own fearlessness, wanting to be, wanting to be out with other people, legitimate undertaking. And so when you see our president's reaction to these protests in which he characterizes people as anarchists and thugs and so on, um, you can see that as a claim against the government. We have the right to protest even in these conditions. And then, and then the final thing referring, you were kind enough um, to refer to my book, uh, the, the welfare state doesn't come about by its own. The, the welfare state which Europeans take for granted is, is a result of, among other things, catastrophe. Um, it's, uh, the, the, the National Health Service in Britain was largely founded or established by refugee doctors from Central Europe. Very often, some, very, some institution that one takes for granted arises out of an experience of catastrophe. I don't know if this is what, we, what will happen. Certainly my personal experience of American commercial medicine, which 
very, came very close to killing me, made it clear to me that I would rather be somewhere else than my own country in a hospital, which is a terrible thought to have. Because when you're very sick, in fact, this was my thought. When I was very sick, I wanted to be home. I wanted to be in a hospital close to home. And it was in a hospital close to home that I almost died. And that's like, that's, that's a wrenching realization that actually I would have been better off several thousand miles away in some place which had a different medical system where I wasn't speaking my own language than in my own country. So I would like to think that the total failure of our medical system in confrontation with this, with this pandemic will lead us to think not just about mild reforms such as, such as the one under President Obama, but a total reform of our health system, which is sadly a bit of a disaster. I've given you lots of time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for convening this gathering and thank you for this opportunity to speak about this topic, very interesting topic. Thank you, Institute, and uh, also this opportunity to speak about it with Mr. Strider. Thank you for this book, for this new book, maybe our malady, when I gave from Mr. Snyder. Now, and now allow me uh, maybe to uh, speak about a little bit different experience from Czech Republic. Uh, when I uh, remember this, uh, the beginning of this crisis in Czech Republic, I remembered what came to my mind was memories on events in the 80s, a Chernobyl tragedy in Chernobyl tragedy in the 80s. And uh, my feeling is that I was convinced that also this situation and this pandemic is also something like, 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 like test, very important test for government. Maybe you know that uh, in the 80s, and it's my deep conviction, this Chernobyl uh, event was important. It was something like that we lost the last illusions about uh, communist and socialist government in this time. And I, 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 it's probably it was not the fundament, but probably very important part of this atmosphere in this year. And that's why also it seems to me that also in March this year, I had also a very strong feeling that uh, for this government, uh, this challenge is fundamental. And there is something which could be crucial for the whole position and the fate of this government. And uh, maybe you know that in this time, Czech government uh, started to have sessions maybe fourth time per week, regularly sometimes the whole day. I remember that we spent the whole night with experts, with epidemiologists, and uh, we all started to study epi epi uh, epidemiology and all these fields. It was, and uh, I, I remember that I also spent many hours with uh, some of uh, famous Czech uh, experts and started, uh, and, and our, our striving was to understand uh, something which was absolutely new and, and it was a feeling that to make mistake could be fatal. And probably it's true that, uh, and, and I'm, I'm glad that in this time the result of this discussion was relatively, relatively st strong and, and, and uh, relatively uh, fast and uh, uh, strict, strict position of Czech government to this epidemic. It, it was probably right, right decision. Com if, if we compare uh, development in, in, in Britain, in US and, and Sweden and other countries. And uh, from the beginning I was convinced that the fundamental thing is to keep confidence between government and people. And that, that to lose this confidence could be fatal in, in a similar situation. And maybe to, to, to make balance now in Czech Republic, it, it, it's, it's very easy. If you look at polls, uh, it seems that nothing changed. On the end of this crisis, when you compare situation on the beginning of March and now, nothing changed. Maybe what I can say now that I, I am I'm convinced that government was not excellent and also in a similar situation, always you, you make mistakes. But uh, uh, in, in, in crucial things, probably Czech government was able to make right decisions. And uh, 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 
we were probably able to to manage this period of health crisis. Probably, maybe I can say that it seems to me that it was also the test of Czech health system. And the result is relatively, relatively positive in comparison with the other systems. It's interesting also with the systems in relatively countries which are very developed countries. But uh, for us it was big, big information that uh, countries, very developed countries, uh, high developed countries were not so successful. I'm speaking about, for example, Italy and I don't know Spain and uh, I don't know France and the result were worse than in, in Czech Republic, in Central Europe. Probably there are also different factors, but uh, in, in general picture it is very interesting and important for us. Uh, that's, um, but the problem is that the story is not finished. Because everybody knows that uh, the story and health crisis is only one part of this problem. And now more and more we are devoting time and energy to economic problems. Health crisis is not finished, but we are starting to solve the economic problems and nobody knows how will the situation develop in future months. Maybe I am positive. My conviction is that the main problem now is to manage three, four months and I hope maybe there will be vaccine in, in January and February and then the situation in the spring the next year could be different and much more relaxed, much more calm. But uh, many questions are open because also in Czech Republic now we have big debt. It's uh, probable that also the next year this debt will be also very high. And uh, uh, the government are, is doing many very important decisions about taxation. And this situation is big opportunity uh, because I'm convinced that our system has many Mm, has many failures and many problems and I see especially for me and my party there is a big opportunity to speak and maybe to uh, to push uh, progressive taxation <coughs> to change system of taxation in our country and probably these are the problems which could be crucial for much more important balance after after some time the next year. Everything is open and uh, I see this crisis as opportunity, especially for a segment which I, am care, which I care about now, about culture, because I spoke about it with the Mr. Snyder. It seems to me that in my country, in Czech Republic, we are facing great underestimation, of especially not only culture, but social, sci social sciences generally. And I'm convinced that it is a must to make something with this problem. To, to, to open way to the future, it is a must in our countries to, to do something uh, to change our mentality. Because what I see in uh, countries like Germany, Britain, US, there is much more attention, also money devoted to culture creative industry. And in Czech Republic, we have big potential in this field. But at the same time, the big underestimation of social sciences and culture is something on the margin and something what is also on the rest. And it seems to me that speaking about li li livelihood for the future and, and about really positive development of our country, there are many things which we have to change. That's why I. It seems to me that crisis is a moment when change, something like when changes are accelerating. Crisis is accelerating changes. I have opportunity to use this atmosphere, to use this moment, and you can also lost. And uh, that's why it's uh, interesting time, but crucial time. And uh, uh, the, the problem is how we will be able to utilize this situation. And it's too soon for summary, also in Czech Republic. Maybe we were able to manage this 
first etap, relatively indecent way, because of these positive poles. But much more important will, will be the situation after one, two years. And I am afraid that it is open. It is all it is what is what is. And it's maybe my uh, very moderate uh, picture <laughs> of current situation. <laughs> so from my, from my point of view. So. Thank you. I think uh, the responses really well reflect uh, a different type of society that uh, the, 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 the speakers come from and the uh, different understanding of solidarity versus individualism uh, as experienced then during the crisis. Now, let me bring the discussion. You said that crisis is an opportunity, but it's still an ongoing crisis. So there is still some time for uh, assessing what has actually happened and uh, what we can learn from that. Uh, let me try to move the debate to the international scene and try to map some preliminary uh, lessons learned from what has happened with the international collaboration. So I would like to ask, how do you assess the international collaboration and solidarity in dealing oh. with the COVID pandemic? And what lessons do you think that we can learn from this for dealing with potential future crises, uh, whether in the European context or international context, international organizations? Yeah. Thank you. Now I can start because I'm very glad that Mr. Snyder is here today because I'm convinced that uh, US elections are fundamental event not only for United States of America, but it is something which is very important also for us. And I am very glad that I can ask questions today for Mr. Snyder. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a uh, it's fascinating opportunity because really, uh, yes, for me it is important what is happening in Czech Republic, but now in current state, in current world, it's clear that uh, also this pandemic crisis is showing that uh, it is the, our domestic well-being is very closely connected uh, with uh, the rest of the world. And uh, now I can say I am a little bit concerned about current development in the United States. I would like to explain why. Because if I said that crisis is accelerating changes, that's why it's, it seems to me relatively clear what type of changes is accel are accelerating? Waning American leadership, faltering global cooperation, great power discord. I can give example, US attack on World Health Organization. I'm convinced that in similar situation we need this international organization very much and uh, in my opinion it was the must to strengthen the position of World Health Organization. Uh, we are facing different tendency to attack this organization. And uh, to, uh, to, be, to, be, to be more brutal, I would like to commemorate uh, Donald Trump uh, sentence that European Union is our foe, or foe enemy. Uh, it was said, I don't, I don't know if it was Japan and so. And th that's why my conviction is that in the world that we are facing many global challenges, not only pandemic, but also climate change and uh, nuclear um, and so. The, the, one of the biggest problems which I see is this unability to create alliances, to accept the role of international organization. And we, we see absolutely different tendency to attack this organization. In the midst of this crisis, th that, uh, it seems to me that the attacks, for example, on China, China are growing. Maybe a few days ago, Mr. Pompeo visited Czech Republic and um, uh, recommended to um, to, to, to help US to block, to block cooperation with, with China. Um, I, know, I, I, I know, I have no doubt that uh, China is big problem and so, and the problem is, yeah, and, and we need alliance maybe to face similar challenge like China or Russia, but 
The problem is that I am not afraid that we are creating alliances. It seems to me that US with Donald Trump are playing their own game. That is not alliance. It's only 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 sole game of of Donald Trump. It is not enough in similar situation. You know what I think, what I mean that in pandemic crisis it is really extremely important to be able to cooperate, but we are facing absolutely different tendencies. Th that's why I said that I am concerned about situation, especially during this, uh, during this crisis. And, uh, and that is not absolutely new, but also if I, if I look to the past, it was uh, US policy in Syria and Afghanistan and other parts Repeatedly it was seen that the US has little interest either in alliances, either in engagement in this part of the world. And uh, uh, in the US we saw more and more concentration on domestic issues and uh, conviction that uh, the pillar of US policy has to be uh, domestic, uh, solving domestic problem. And the same was also during this pandemic crisis. Also in the midst, if this crisis was clear that for current federal government in US, the main problem is to solve situation in the United States. And, this, and, and it was no tendency of US uh, to rally or to, 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 to be, to lead uh, community to solve this global problem. And uh, that is uh, something which is that during this crisis was seen that uh, this country, which is so important for current world order, was not willing to play this part as somebody who is, uh, who is uh, helping to create common approach and common, common strategy. And uh, what I'm afraid is that uh, I am not sure if current election in November are able to solve this problem. Yes, I, I'm not sure that everybody knows that yeah, now we, 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 can, we can make stakes who will be the winner and, uh, and uh, I hardly imagine that Donald Trump could continue but there are many people which are convinced that Trump is able to win. But I am, uh, it, it could be probably very serious thing if similar politics will continue. But I'm also not sure if different alternative, if Joe Biden is able to change this general move and general tendency in which uh, US are shifting in, in last time. And uh, it's, I, I remember this uh, sentence of Angela Merkel, I don't know when it was, when she said that now we are, uh, now we are uh, alone here in Europe. There is no chance to, 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 to count with the help of the United States for the future. And uh, that is something which seems to me fundamental. We are living in a world when there is a must. It seems there is a must to face global problems when we need to speak one another and create global alliances, but at the same time seems that current US are not able to help us and situation is much more uh, uh, dangerous and that's why I, I am glad that I can ask Mr. Snyder. It seems to me that what I see in last days in the United States, there are clashes in the streets between left radicals and left wing radicals on one side and the right wing radicals on the other side and maybe it's my only speculation the um, people this uh, in the mid or 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 in middle, middle class. class middle class is staying at home and it is something which reminds me situation in 30s in germany yeah, this clashes between left radicals and right radicals 
and uh, middle class is silent. I don't no, no, don't want to have like a more brutal comparison, but only brutal, but apologize for this. But really, it came to my mind that it's something similar because people are dying in, in U.S. streets. There are concrete examples people which are dying in these clashes, and that's why I I I am I uh, I am able to say is that is this not something which is so close and close to situation which we know from Germany in the 30s. People are dying in similar, very similar clashes and middle class is staying at home. And uh, it seems fantastic, yes, maybe for somebody it is some fantastic, but, but I am not sure it is so big fantasy. This nearly civil war in the United States, country which was recently the pillar of uh, uh, global order. And I, I remember very well President Obama, I had opportunity to, uh, to thank Barack Obama for his uh, policy, for his stress on multilateral policy in current world. I very, I very appreciate this. It was for a country like Czech Republic, it was a fundamental thing. And in a very short time, I am feeling absolutely different tendency in the in, in US, a uh, tendency which seems to me could lead really to something like civil war. I don't know if elections are able to solve this situation, if elections are able to give results which will be respected and we will be really able to calm down situation and create solution. I can imagine that also after election all this uh, fight and all these clashes could continue. And that's my probably not easy question. What can we expect for current US? What can we expect for this, for, from this election? I apologize for this so rough question, Mr. Snyder, but you have to understand that I have this opportunity to ask you. It's an extraordinary opportunity. And uh, you, you, uh, I, am, I appreciate that you visited Central Europe, and then you have to face similar question. Když mluvíme pro americký nacionalismus, já chtěl bych vám děkovat za to, že já můžu mluvit anglicky. So uh, th th let me. I, I will answer the question, but I want to take a few steps back. Um, and, 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 and rest for a moment on, on, on Dagmar's original questions about multilateralism and international order, and try to say a few things about Mr. Trump, which then might help to answer Minister Zawaradik, your question. So I think one level of the problem has to do with democracy. So we can speak about multilateralism in general, but the, the European Union is mostly, um, not entirely anymore, but mostly a union of democracies. And the transatlantic relationship was always understood as one that was between democracies. I think it's it, it, one of the things which has changed is that the President of the United States is not an advocate of democracy. He doesn't believe in democracy. So he doesn't like leaders like um, President Macron or Chancellor Merkel who, are, who, who won elections. He doesn't like people who won elections. He's, he's against that. He likes dictators. And this is not me saying it. This is him saying it over and over and over again. He has a list of his favorite dictators and he'll say, this, he, this one is my currently my favorite dictator. And that is a serious problem for one form of multilateralism because leaders who are democrat I believe leaders who have democratic legitimation respect each other in a certain way and leaders who are dictators respect each other in a different way and Mr. Trump is somewhere in between because he did sort of win an American election but 
he respects the dictators. He wants to be like the dictators. He admires the dictators. So I think that's, that's one level of the problem. I want to disagree slightly with Minister Zawaradik's characterization of America as paying less attention to the world and more attention to its own domestic problems. Because in the last three years, we've paid no attention to our domestic problems at all. Um, this, we've passed basically no legislation. I'm not counting legislation which cuts taxes for the wealthy because that's not legislation, that's gravity, okay? That's, that's inertia. Um, so if you don't count legislation which makes wealthy people wealthier, we basically have done nothing for three and a half years. So it's, I, I'm going to resist this, this reflex that we're withdrawing from the world to take care of ourselves because taking care of ourselves is precisely what we're not doing. And the pandemic is actually evidence of that. So in other words, it's, it's, a, it's possible to make a complete mess of foreign policy and domestic policy at the same time. Um, and there is a logic to it, I think. And, and here's, here's the logic, and this is my second point. So the first point was about democracy. The second point is about universalism. So I completely agree with your remarks about the virus and about globalism or universalism. Um, uh, you know, as, as, as Camus put it very nicely in La Peste, a, a virus is a test for humanity. And so do you care about humanity or do you not care about humanity? If you care about humanity, then one would cooperate with other institutions, with other, with other countries. But what if you don't? And here's the second problem. So in the United States, the way that we have treated the virus has been very unequal. Um, it's, uh, I mean, I, I will not be surprised if later historians who have better access to documents than I do look on this as something which verges on ethnic cleansing. Because when a government um, which knows that certain parts of its population are in, are in greater threat of death than other parts and chooses not to act for that reason, it's making the decision about demography and ethnicity and about the future composition of its population. And that, we happen to know, is what the American presidential administration did. They knew full well that the disease was affecting the city of New York, uh, the state of New York, and other places where black and brown people live and where democratic voting people live. And the decision was taken, therefore, not to do anything on the logic that those people will then die and we will then blame the local authorities for it, and that will be a good electoral strategy for us. So what I'm trying to say is that if you don't believe in humanity at home, it's very unlikely that you're going to believe in humanity abroad. And that's, that's, that's the second way that the Trump administration, the second fundamental way I think the Trump administration um, would be opposing this, you know, the, the kind of multilateralism which you and I, I think would, would, would favor. Now, on, yes, on, 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 on Germany and, um, and the middle classes and so on. I remember in 2016, or maybe it was early 2017, I was doing an interview with a German uh, journalist, and I, I said, I want you to write that I said that Germany is now the most important democracy in the world. And the German journalist said, I refuse to have you say that. Like, that's, <laughs> that's, that's an unthinkable thought. You know, we in Germany, cannot think that. I cannot print an American saying that Germany is a more important democracy than America. And I said, no, I insist that you print this because it's true and it's going to be very important for the next few years and you Germans have to get used to it. And he said, no, no, that's not going to go into the interview, right? Which says something, I think, and it didn't, which says something, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> which says something very important about this relationship. I mean, you, you said these very kind words about America historically being a pillar of stability and a democracy and so on, which is, you know, that's, that's, that's sort of true. It's not completely true. I think Americans praise their democracy too much and Germans are too hard on their democracy for understandable historical reasons. And one has to, you know, sometimes one has to flip things around. 
right? Every, everybody has been able to vote in Germany for several decades now. In the United States, the ability of human beings or citizens to vote has been going down for the last decade. And we never quite reached the point where everyone could, could vote. So um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't, mind, I don't mind at all the historical comparisons. And I'm going to tell you what I think about them. Um, for me, I mean, since, especially since we're in Austria, I think the much more familiar comparison would be um, the, would be the, uh, the 1934 in Austria. Oh, I love how the Austrians are now like, wait, what happened in 1934? I caught, <laughs> I caught a bunch of you doing that. <laughs> Come on, you know, Heimwehr. You don't, you don't remember this? Okay, so the, in, in 1934, the, the, the Austrian, both the left and the right, had an organized paramilitary. The, the right was a little bit more organized and acted first, and the right ends up winning. And, and so the reason why Austria comes to mind, to me always, is that in Austria, the socialists, like the Democrats in the US now, clearly have more voters, right? So the Democrats in the US are a, they're a slightly, you know, <laughs> They're a, they're a slightly disorganized, uh, slightly confused majority party. And in that way, they're a bit like the interwar Austrian socialists or the SPD in Germany. They, the, the Democrats have a clear majority, but they have a problem holding power, right? Which is like the interwar socialists in Austria. The interwar socialists um, ha, should, in principle, should have controlled the state, but they didn't control the state. And one of the reasons they didn't control the state was that they were less willing to use violence. Hmm. Um, so that brings me up to the present moment. I, the US is different because the, par the, the paramilitaries are not that well organized. So it's true that the average American owns, don't quote me on this, but like if you divide it up, the average American owns more than one gun. <laughs> um, but, and, that was, and that wasn't true in interwar Europe. But we don't have organized paramilitaries associated with political parties. So Mr. Trump can't, and this is one of the things I worried about at the beginning, that he doesn't have his own, you know, God forgive me for saying this, but he doesn't have his own SA or SS. Um, he doesn't even have his own, you know, he doesn't have his Trump Jugend. They're, they're, not, they're not organized in this. And imagine like what a Trump Jugend would look like, right? They'd all be, they'd all be unfit, right? <laughs> they couldn't march in a straight line. They'd constantly be asking their parents for help. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, they keep saying it was all about me, you know? <laughs> okay. Um, they wouldn't be able to start a fire and they would blame the Democrats. Um, so, but that, that's the difference. So the, the, there is violence, but there isn't, you don't have people who can give orders and get a thousand people out, right? Um, that's, and another difference is the armed forces. So in Austria in 1934, you know, the armed forces and the Heimwehr basically ended up being on the same side and Vienna gets shelled and the socialists and the majority lose. In the United States, the armed forces made it clear in June when the president tried to use them against protesters that they were not going to go along. So that's, that's a difference. I don't mean to deny or minimize the violence that there is, but those are, those are the differences that I see. And in this connection, it's also very important for me to stress that, um, I guess, two things. One is that uh, we, we're losing about 1,000 people a day to coronavirus. So, I mean, a thousand, right? This whole country has lost, what, 741? Um, we lose a thousand people every day to coronavirus, and that is, for me, the violence that should be front and center every single day, because that shouldn't be happening. Um, and the second thing that I want to stress is that it's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit too easy to immediately start talking about the violence. Um, we had this summer the largest um, peaceful set of demonstrations in the United States, perhaps ever, but certainly since the 1960s, which went largely unnoticed in, in Europe. Um, what's, what draws a lot of attention, I understand, is when you know a black person breaks a window. That's great. Everybody wants to have a picture of that. Or when someone in a crowd who's maybe a provo provocateur throws something that's on fire. I get it, that makes a great photograph. But the thing that actually happened was that we had thousands of demonstrations 
all over the country, including in places where only white people live. And what also happened is that public opinion has clearly shifted on this question. So while there's still plenty of racists in the United States, it's clear now that, that, that it's not a majority, which might not have been true, let's say 20 or 30 years ago. There, now, there is, so I think there is a risk of the kind you're describing, but the reason there's a risk of the kind you're describing is because the most important person in the country wants that scenario. Oh, Mr. Trump, am I still on mic? Okay, Mr. Trump, because um, at a certain point, you know, they cut me off when I talk like this. Um, <laughs> Mr. 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 Trump is perfectly aware that he is that he is way down in the polls. Um, if it weren't for the fact that the Democrats and the, and, and American liberals are so scared, you you know, they would be talking more about this. He's way down in the polls. He basically has no way to win. Okay, in a conventional sense. And if you don't believe me ask him because he's not running a campaign. He's not trying to get a majority. He's trying to rally the people who already support him into doing the kinds of unorthodox things that you're talking about. So I do worry about this scenario. I think there will be more violence between now and November. I think there will be violence in November. I do, however, think that a lot of Americans are already thinking about this. A lot of people have already made plans, and I do think the election will go forward. I, for, for, like, for European journalists, one thing which is very important to note is that we, we will not have a result on November 3rd, so you don't have to stay up late. Just like, just go to bed. Don't write who won, okay? I mean, Biden's gonna win, but don't write that. Just go to bed, because we're not gonna be able to project who won on November 3rd, and it doesn't matter, okay? That was always a cultural convenience to know who won the same day. We don't have to count the votes until early December. So everyone just chill. <laughs> everyone just chill. Let us have our riots. Let us count the votes um, and wait till early December. No, because I say this because this is Mr. Trump's play. He's trying to convince everyone that if it's not counted on November 3rd, that's a national emergency and he's gonna declare a national emergency, okay? So we all have to know that that's, not, that's a fake national emergency, that we have five weeks to count the ballots, and that's fine. Um, so yeah, I worry, I worry about this, but I wouldn't worry about it if there weren't an instigator in, in the White House. Wow. <laughs> I feel like there was a fear of even darker picture of the civil war in the US, but I think the picture we got was dark enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure if that's, that's good or bad news. Um, as, a, as a political scientist, one uh, lesson that runs through the history is that if there's an internal crisis, the, the easy um, fix, so to speak, uh, for leaders uh, to fix this, uh, this crisis domestically is to blame someone externally and to find an external enemy and uh, find some um, straw man, so to speak, to, uh, to put the attention to. And um, I'm wondering, is this a scenario that we can expect uh, and we should be uh, afraid of, especially if, if you look at the uh, current uh, Trump's rhetoric on the virus as a Chinese virus. So there's already a lot of very negative publicity going in, in the direction of, of China as a potential threat, or maybe not potential, to the United States. Um, how do you see this dynamic of the uh, international hostility between the US, China, maybe Russia, now with the events in Belarus. Yeah, it's also for me maybe a reason how to raise this like question for mm -hmm. uh, on, on Mr. Snyder, because uh, also this uh, is one very interesting and important topic uh, for me, because uh, uh, the problem of China. If I am right, it seems that in the United States, between Republicans and Democrats, that is uh, one topic uh, uh, where is consensus. And this consensus is 
connected with the relation to China. If, if am I right, it seems that on both sides there is conviction that the main challenge for current United States represent China. And uh, I remember my meeting with Dalai Lama many, many years ago. Uh, it was interesting because I remember he told me in this time, it was a little bit different time than now, I know, but he told me, what is most important, you have to speak with them. Also, when we take this Politburo, he told me, there are differences between individuals in this Politburo. He told me, this guy is very tough, it has no sense, but this is much better, much moderate, it has sense to speak with them. Ah, uh, I was convinced that it is wise, yes, not to say Chinese are something amorph, abstract, but there are also concrete people. And the role of Democrats in current world is to look for and uh, look for another Democrats in different parts of the world, in different countries, and try to create alliances with these Democrats in these different countries, in different parties. Uh, there is maybe only chance to create these uh, alliances. And also in countries like China and so. I, I know that many things changed from this time. And China uh, started in different direction and be more and more assertive and sometimes nearly arrogant. But also, and I, I am not sure if uh, this uh, tendency and this consensus in United States politics is really good directive for the future. Because I have to say, I read this book from Mr. Ellison about took it as trap. Yes, and that's why you can imagine that I am asking if we are not there is a danger to continue in this direction. And also, when I take this pandemic, and the result of this uh, episode is also further escalation of this relation between US and China. Uh, you know very well that for Europe it represents very difficult situation, because Mr. Pompeo is visiting countries here in Europe and asking us to be part of this story and to help U.S. to go against China. And uh, for us it is difficult decision making, because here in Europe there was tendency to lead some dialogue and cooperate. Germany is a good example. So Germany has many very deep economic contacts with China. It was this card, maybe, that cooperation has uh, sense and there is chance how to, how to create more, more uh, world in which uh, co um, will be much more possible to live together and mainly not only to live, but solve all this fundamental global problem which we are facing now. And uh, we can escalate this uh, relation but the question is, we are facing something like tendency to decouple, to decouple world, technologically decouple and, uh, and uh, economically decouple. Maybe the different uh, monetary systems, different uh, financial systems. And uh, but my question is, is this only possible option, this decoupling, or if, for example, in the US, Joe Biden will be president, there is chance to think about different scenario and uh, maybe, to st maybe to make attempt to find partners. We always I had feeling that when we are escalating things, that we are at the, same, at the same time strengthening the position, the position of hawks in this country, yes. It's the same in Iran, for example. 
I can tell you during my, as I, as I was Minister of Foreign Affairs, I visited Tehran in this time because everybody know what was the position of European Union in this, play, in this game. We were convinced that we have to make stake on hope and give chance Iranians to cooperate with us. You know that uh, one of the fundamental deep deeds of Mr. Trump was that he totally broken this uh, deal with Iran and started with an absolutely different policy. And this policy is happening right in these days. In these days, US are trying to undermine and to destroy this deal and to, and to continue this attack on, on Iran. I, maybe you understand that I was deeply convinced that this EU politics to Iran had chance because I had opportunity to visit Tehran. I know that Ira Tehran was, was theocratic regime, but I had opportunity to speak with the people in uh, government, people which were very close to people which I remember from 60s in Czech Republic, this uh, progressive people with a tendency to modernize the country. I remember Minister of Finance, Vice Chairman of the government in Iran, he told me, we have last chance to do something to modernize this country. In opposite, we are lost. And I had opportunity to meet with the, the, these guys. Uh, these guys were my, it, it, they were my partners. I was convinced that it is our role. I, I feel obliged to help these people to, to give chance to this path of modernization of the country. But Trump policy destroyed all, all this and burned this, uh, this tendency to, 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 to cre create this alliance with the Democrats in Iran. I know that every country is different. Uh, China is a special problem, very complicated. But my question is, is if this consensus on China policy in the US is not this uh, way to to get it as to get it as trap in the world and i i i i i, I, I it would be it's it, for me it's very interesting to know your approach to this problem and how do you see this issue well of course when everyone when anyone talks about thucydides i get all dreamy and i think ah the first historian the way he used primary sources pushed legend out of the picture completely, minimized his own rule. What a beautiful book. That's what I was thinking the entire time. Um, I, I, so the, the, the idea in Thucydides, the, 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 the Graham Allison book has the idea that the two greatest powers must inevitably fight. That's the Thucydides thesis. Well, whereas, of course, the, the, the actual book about the Peloponnesian Wars contains a thousand bits of wisdom, of which that is perhaps not, not one. Um, uh, on this, uh, on the issue of consensus, I'm going to try to uh, I'm going to try to turn the question around, and and be a bit critical now of Europe because it seems to me that um, whether I'm talking to, you know, Czech Czech Social Democrats or or German businessmen, the approach is always something like, uh, when are the Americans going to become reasonable about China, and I actually don't think one can be reasonable about China, and that is for, 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 for reasons of principle. Um, I, I think, let me, let's, let me try to explain this with respect to Belarus. There was a, the question, there was a question about Belarus. What's the relationship? Um, well, the Americans haven't had much to say about Belarus because, you know, currently we like dictators. But the, um, but the, the, and we, and we especially like, you know, slightly aging dictators who have like children who they like to put in prominent display. We like that. Um, the ambassador was not laughing at all when I said that. Um, it's the, but the Europeans have also done far too little about Belarus. And I, I think you have a problem, which is that you're not sure, you know, fundamentally you're not sure whether values are part of the European enterprise or not. 
And I think they have to be, because I think if you, if you don't have a European foreign policy, which is about democracy, you will eventually stop being democracies yourself. Because on this issue, democracy, it's, a, it's, a, it's no, less than, no less than epidemiology. It's, it's global. So you have to, you're either for it or you're against it. And, or you, maybe you don't care. But you, 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 what you can't do is say, democracy is fine for us, but maybe it's not OK for other people, which I think is a very strong European temptation. And I think it's a mistake. So with, I, I, what's, what's interesting about Belarus, what, what makes Belarus such a pure, interesting case is that it's only about democracy. Right? You can't look at it and say, well, you know, I don't like this personality or that personality. It's not about personalities. You can't even look at it and say, I don't like this policy or that policy because the opposition has no policies. The only thing the opposition is saying is we want to have clean elections. And so the question then for you know, Vienna and Warsaw and, you know, and Vilnius and Kiev and, and Berlin and so on is do you care about clean elections? And there have been different kinds of answers from the different European capitals. But I'm struck that there hasn't been such a clear answer in general from Europe. Now that leads me to China because I'm, I'll say what I think about Trump and China in a minute, but I don't think that the place to start with China is we do a lot of business with it and that's all we're gonna say. Because if that's all you're gonna say, then and you have nothing to say about the values, then you're saying that China is a normal country. Um, and I don't think China's a normal country. I don't, I, I don't wanna live, like if we do this in a Kantian way and say, would you like to live in China? Right? Would, would, you, would you switch places? Would you like to live in China? Would you like to have that level of digital surveillance? Of course you don't, right? Europeans don't want to have that kind of digital surveillance. Would you like to live in a country which has concentration camps for ethnic minorities? You know, no, I don't, I mean, I'm not taking a poll, but I assume that most Europeans do not think that that's normal. So I agree with Americans who think we can't just treat China as though it's a big market. And you know, frankly, I think just treating China as though it's a big market has gotten, is part of the reason why the United States is where it is. Um, that's part of the trap that we fell into, and I think you're standing before the same trap. I mean, there are a lot of things which have already happened to us which could happen to you, and China is one, and digitalization of life is another one. And so when we get to China, so I guess here I'm going to disagree, I don't think the question is like, when are the Americans going to be reasonable, and can't we just get a reasonable American? I think, I think the question is something more like, are there American and European values which we might be able to agree about with some other administration, and then talk about China together? Because see, the, like the framework of the question is something like, we Europeans already get that we have to deal with the reasonable Chinese and the Americans just don't get it. I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I, I, think, I think the issue is something like, hopefully something like, can, can we reach a point where Americans and Europeans sometimes talk to themselves, talk to each other before they talk to China? Because as I see it, I mean, if the, if the world were entirely like China, it would be a worse world. And, um, and, and I, as I also see it, neither the United States nor the European Union can actually deal with China on its own. And what the, Trump, what, what the Trump foreign policy, I think, has actually led to is a situation where there have been too many meetings between Europeans and Chinese in the last three years without the Americans being present, which has led us to the situation where the Europeans, you know, now the default position is, oh, well, it's a big market and when are the Americans gonna be reasonable? So our policy, I think, has been totally counterproductive because we've taken ourselves out of these conversations. And I agree, you have to, you have to talk to people. Um, and and what, we've, what we have led to is, is this image, you know, that, that we are being totally unreasonable, and we are, and that's been, a great, that's been a great opportunity for the Chinese. So is there a consensus in the U.S. that China is a problem? Yes, there is a consensus in the U.S. that China is a problem, and I think there are people who hold that view who are entirely reasonable. In fact, I think there are people in the Trump administration who, whose, whose ideas about China are perfectly sensible. Um, however, I'm not saying that our policy towards China has been <laughs> perfectly sensible. What we have done with China has been very inconsistent. Um, we fought a trade war on the one hand, and then we've asked the Chinese to intervene in our elections on the other hand. Um, Mr. Trump has asked, basically, every time he gets a meeting with somebody, he says, like, hey, can you help me with the elections, right? He asks Xi to intervene in American elections on what this is, yes, this is not a secret. Um, it's in John Bolton's book. 
Um, it's, it's, that's how Mr. Trump sees the world. So the, I think the problem with the current administration is that a, a, a policy of, of, I think, of skepticism towards China, which I'm gonna repeat, I think some members of this administration um, hold for good reasons, actually, a policy of skepticism towards China has become a basically ethnocentric excuse for our own disasters. So when we call the when we call the virus the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus, we are of course indulging in ethnic blaming and we're indulging in in nationalism. And the problem so the problem is that we the, the Trump administration doesn't really have a China policy at this point. It's very inconsistent. You know, he, one day he, play, he praises, if you look back at his tweets, he was actually very friendly towards, towards Xi and the Chinese Communist Party for the whole beginning of 2020. There are lots of tweets about how great the Chinese are doing with the virus. Um, there, you know, on the, uh, on the day the first person died in Hong Kong, there was, um, there was a congratulation to Chairman Xi for the anniversary of the Chinese Revolution. So there, there's lots of friendly stuff towards China. It's very inconsistent. I think the difference is that, yes, you're gonna to have to deal, you know, knock on wood with the Biden administration, which is not gonna say right out of the gate, hey, the only problem is we need to talk about business with China. That's not what the Biden administration is gonna say. If there's a, you know, assuming there's American democracy in February 21. Um, and, and so I'm gonna turn the question around and say this. You, the, you, why is it that Europeans always ask, what are the Americans going to do? Why, don't, why shouldn't there be a prepared a, a European dossier on important for, foreign policy questions, including China, that's ready on January 21st, rather than waiting to see what the Biden people are gonna say? Because the Biden people are, of course, preoccupied with domestic affairs right now. They have to worry about the scenario that you're talking about, namely, they have, the Biden people have to both win an election and they have to, and they have to win the civil unrest afterwards, right? They, they have to run two campaigns at the same time. They have to run the election campaign and the mobilization campaign at the same time. So I'm sh I don't think they're actually thinking about China right now, and I, I, I don't blame them. So how about you know, we, we flip things around and, and think about this as a European responsibility to come to the Biden administration in February and say, here, here are the things we think are very important. Because I think, I think waiting for the Americans you know, is, is in, this case, in this case a bad bet. Um, so I've, I've, I've talked enough about this, so let's, let's go to the next question. Oh, thank you for opening so many interesting, uh, interesting questions and themes. Uh, I would love to follow on uh, so many of them, but I feel that there must be uh, a lot of pressing questions in the room from the audience. So I would like to open the floor uh, and ask who would like to ask our speakers. Thank you very much for both these distinguished speakers. My name is Anna Dornova. I'm at the Institute of Advanced Studies and I'm a political sociologist. So my question will be more on the knowledge uh, and around. And uh, Mr. Snyder, at the beginning of your talk, you talked about that institution arise always from catastrophe. So my question would be, what is the institution that is going to arise from what we see right now in all the efforts uh, in containing the pandemic? And what I had in mind while listening to your stories was a somehow, let's frame it in a blunt way, um, a distinction between more paternalistic institutions, that's what we've seen in the Czech Republic, for example, where you have the massive orders, the lockdown orders, and the institutional uh, authorities are the ones that are actually prescribing the behavior as opposed, for example, to the Swedish model, or even, even in the US context, you may find a lot of individual agency playing with the individual responsibility. And I find this paternalism versus individual autonomy quite interesting because as you've shown from the US example, it can turn the opposite way in a very dangerous way. So is there a lesson learned in terms of institution that needs to arise or needs to be reformed apart from the healthcare institution that you've been talking about? And related to that, maybe I had a question to Mr. Zawarlik as well. I uh, was very interested in how you were uh, describing the role of social scientists in all this and how you've been actually calling for social scientists to be more included in the debate. So my question would be, how do we do that? 
uh, how, we, how do we do that apart from being uh, interviewed and intellectual attachments to national newspaper or having a distinguished debate somewhere? How do we actually reach the voices? How do we reach the press conferences? Because I think that there is an imminent task and I'd like to illustrate it on one example. I think that what the pandemic has shown is that there is a huge uh, role of, pan of public framing of events, not the virus itself, but how it's publicly framed. And this is a light critique on what you said. I think it was marvelously pointed out when you were describing the Black Lives Matter protest as a radical left between radical right. I told you as a political scientist, a sociologist, I would tell you that this is exactly the public framing that deprives us actually from seeing what is the role of a Black Lives Matter protest for civil society. Because once we frame it as a radical against radical, we don't really have a discussion on the role of these civil rights that are so fundamental to democracies all over the world. So thank you very much once again for these thoughts. Okay, so I'm, it's, it's a hard question because it's about the future and also as the way you frame the question suggests, it, it involves every, every, every single country, right? So, and I, I wasn't in every single country during the pandemic. I've only, I've only been in th three. Um, I can tell you what institutions I think were missing in the US. Um, some, maybe some not obvious examples. One of them is local news. So it's, it's very hard to believe in an epidemic if you don't know about it personally. And one of the problems that we had in the US was that people would start dying, even in considerable numbers, but it wasn't reported. And, and so unless you, unless you happen to know someone personally, it wasn't real to you. And I, I could see this by, you know, by the counter examples, like every time local reporters did find, for example, a nursing home where there, where there was a pile of bodies, people noticed. But there were a lot of nursing homes and a lot of piles of bodies, and most of them weren't reported. Every time a local reporter caught a government under-reporting deaths, people noticed, but I'm quite confident that most of the time that happened, there was no reporter to catch them because we just don't have enough reporters anymore. So I think the weakness of our local news, and this is again one of these things where, you know, Europe is 15 years behind and you still have a chance not to make the same mistakes, but the local news helps make an event like, like an epidemic real. And because we didn't have it, more real for people was what was said in Washington or what was said in St. Petersburg or Beijing. Because we had a tremendous problem, you know, and this goes back to what China is, we had a tremendous problem with Russia, still do, with Russian and Chinese propaganda playing a bigger role in conversations in Arkansas and Nebraska than what was actually happening in Arkansas and Nebraska. We have a big problem with foreign entities and also domestic entities who game the algorithms on Facebook and other social platforms in order to drive Americans into a frenzy um, and, away from, and away from the facts. So, so lo local, news, local news would be an institution that, that I would fix on. And I was gonna, my second answer was gonna be the one that you actually gave as your question to Mr. Zawadalek. I think the framing part is extremely important. And it's why, you know, it's, why, it's why the humanities are so important because it's the humanities that allow journalists and others to see that something is being framed. And it's the humanities that give you the categories to frame things on, on, on your own, right? So if we don't know about the history of interwar Europe, we can't ask the question, is it like that? If we don't have the category of the middle classes, we can't ask about the middle classes, which I forgot to answer, which is that actually the Black Lives Matter protests were middle class protests. Um, as a matter of fact, the middle classes were present, and that's a very important thing to know about them. They were a very middle class, Mittelstand um, kind of affair uh, in, in their mass numbers, right? Not, not the looting, you know, not, not the acts of violence, but the protests themselves were in fact middle class protests, which makes them very important. But I can't frame it that way unless I have the Begriffe, right? Like, so 
knowing what the beglifa are, what the concepts are, and deploying them is something you can only get from the humanities, which is why, you know, which is why I think certain kinds of governments really don't like the humanities, because certain kinds of governments really like to do all the framing by themselves. So, thank you for a question. I would like to, uh, to try to ask, or to, to answer. Um, the first thing, uh, I would like to explain that this task has uh, uh, very concrete, uh, is very concrete now, because you know that now European Union is offering this uh, recovery fund. And the problem is how to gain some money and some segment of this uh, money also for this field of culture and social sciences and so. It's a very concrete task in Czech Republic to raise this question, to discuss during two weeks will be discussion in Czech government. And uh, I, I said many times also that I have interest to participate on this recovery fund and to have some money, especially for some excellent center in social sciences, because it's uh, possible to, sh to, 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 to show that uh, in Czech Republic, we have a limited number of this excellent center in the field of sociology, economy, and others. And that's something very concrete for me, what I am trying to, 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 to raise in, in, in government. And I hope that I will be partly more and um, more and less uh, successful. It's a concrete task. And the second, uh, it, in all countries, also in Czech Republic, uh, <laughs> I'm also concerned about uh, something like very dangerous splitting of discussion that uh, it's all problems are very quickly politicized and escalated. It's uh, if I can any problem in our country, also we have also problem with the status different than in United States, but uh, I'm speaking about Konev, Konev issue in, in, in Prague and so, but, or, or Marian, Mariansky slope, uh, how to say it, Marian column in, 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 in Prague also, the symbol of Habsburg monarchy and so on. And all problems, also cultural problems, are very quickly escalated and part of very, very uh, furious uh, discussion. And uh, that's why, uh, uh, what seems to me interesting to ask is why it is that public uh, uh, space is uh, not functioning, that is falling apart, that this public space is uh, uh, falling apart repeatedly, that it's very difficult to raise question and to lead normal, quiet dialogue about it. It's, 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 it's very complicated in Canada. And, and the, my, my question is, how it is possible that it's so difficult? How, how media sphere is functioning in this system? It seems to me very important to understand better what, why, this, why this terrain is so difficult for public discussion. Uh, it, it is something, in, in, in this I see the role of uh, social sciences to explain, to help us l better understand what are these barriers, what are the reasons why every question is so quickly destroyed in public space and what we have to do to avoid this. What to do to be able really to lead serious, because we need to solve problems, very serious problems, but we are only quarreling, yes, and then maybe, and it's, it's, it seems that it's impossible to raise. I, I remember it was Mr. Brzezinski, he told me years ago, here in this country, in the United States, it's impossible to raise any serious question and uh, lead normal discussion about it. You, you need what probably he, he meant in this time. That he, he, he spoke about uh, the suspicion that Obama is not US American. Uh, he was convinced, he was surprised how quickly this topic started to be the main topic in all, all, all public discussion. Absolute nonsense, but it was the main topic. And it is, it is what I'm speaking about, this epidemic is, uh, uh, is uh, growing not only in the US but in any other country. We are all solving similar nonsensing issues and we are not able to concentrate on really serious questions and to understand better how this public space is working, why it is not 
why is so difficult in current world to, 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 to lead? The, it, it, all these things seems to me are very important to, 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 to investigate and uh, to know uh, how it works. It, it is something, we, when, when I see very important role of social sciences and that they, uh, they have to help us to, to manage this. And I'm afraid it's impossible without these sciences to, to, to manage this terrain, this modern terrain of modern society and uh, medias and, and, and all, all this. And probably I can only agree what uh, Mr. Snyder said that with this framing, that it, uh, the danger that polis politics will frame all discussion and that we need a much more sophisticated system how to raise questions. And it's also part of this what, why it seems to me that uh, social sciences are so important. And uh, in Czech Republic there is a special story why these uh, sciences are underestimated and I see like a challenge to overcome this and to find a way how to change this. It's, uh, and I'm, it's not on the margin. It seems to me it's fundamental for the future. Uh, I'm afraid that we are running out of time, but hopefully there is uh, time for one more question from the audience. So... Uh, I think, <laughs> or I saw two two pairs of hands. Maybe we can take both questions and then try to just answer let them. Let so, if we may, please. <coughs> Thank you very much. My name is Anir Barzilai, and I'm a historian by training. Um, my question is for both uh, speakers, and I would like to address something that we sort of revolved around but didn't really touch, and that would be regarding what I take, and most people I think take, as a sacred fundament of democracy and maybe liberal society, and that's the right to demonstrate and to protest. And the reason I'm asking that is because um, Professor Snyder began his talk by, by obviously mentioning the fact that public health and medicine are always political, but then we sort of went to talk about protests, and you, when, when you began, um, um, your, your, your talk, you said that, you know, for in the United States, corona itself is, is, is as a disease, is not accepted as, as, an, as an objective fact, but Trump denies it. And don't you think that precisely there is an interesting, maybe paradoxical, connection between the denial of corona as a disease and the protests that we see in places like Bela Belarus and in the United States? By the fact that someone like Trump denied the disease, he, was, he didn't have the Trump card, pun intended, of saying, okay, you cannot protest because COVID is happening and it's dangerous. And this is something that we see happening precisely in places that are, I would say, more democratic, more liberal, um, at least on the face of it, when they say, no, no, protest now is something we should avoid. We should avoid precisely because of COVID is a real thing. We saw something happening in Germany, um, a couple of weeks back, we see this thing becoming a theme in Israel. We saw it also in France even. And that is, a, I think, a risk we might truly face when people are using this framing of saying, no, 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 this is an objective thing. This is a disease. There is a virus. You have to basically be in lockdown, in quarantine. You cannot protest. So what do we do about this fundamental liberal dem democratic right of protesting against something that is scientific. Thank you. So can we collect the, the other question as well? Uh, thank you very much. And I am Ivo Sharamek, uh, Czech ambassador to the UN, to the OSCE, and uh, other Vienna-based international organizations. And my question is uh, concerning Belarus, because I'd like to use the opportunity having here the former ministry, Minister of Foreign Affairs and, and uh, Professor uh, Snyder. And it is, of course, the topic we are dealing now quite a lot in the OSCE. Uh, and uh, my question is, what uh, would you recommend as a course of action, EU action, US action towards uh, Belarus? Because what we are witnessing is uh, and it's rather that principled answer that 
we are imposing sanctions, isolating the regime, and, and the EU is doing that, the US is doing that as well. But uh, on the other hand, everybody knows what might be the eventual outcome. And the eventual outcome is that we will push President Lukashenko into even tighter Kremlin embrace and it will be at the end the Kremlin playing the cards, eventually replacing uh, Lukashenko but replacing him by somebody who will be more willing and uh, cooperative with Moscow and then we will lose Belarus for another 20 years. For it's the equation when on one side is the geopolitics and real politic, and on the other side, principles and values. And question is how to play it and not get it into the possible scenario which I described. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Barbara Didaknell, and um, first of all, I have to say I've taken note of your prophecy, um, Professor Snyder, saying that um, Mr. Trump will declare national emergency on November the 3rd. Uh, and I'm really looking forward <laughs> to what is going to happen. Um, I will discuss it with my students. Um, <laughs> The second point I would like um, to touch is um, what you said in the, at the, in the end about China and Europe, um, that Europe is not going to speak with the US with a prepared dossier, for example, on China. China is just one example. We can take any other example. Um, and that's what I'm noting here now, that um, domestic politics are really predominating at the moment, if you're looking at the news, at WF or wherever. Um, and the EU has, has kind of, not disappeared, it's maybe a little exaggerated, but, but it has kind of drawn back, and it's also a question to the minister. Am I right with this observation? I have the impression that it is all national politics at the moment. We don't have any EU anymore. And, and like, Every country has its own national policy on corona and different rules and different laws and whatever. And I'm, I'm, I think that's really sad. I mean, that's really sad. So my question to the minister would be, am I right? And what can we do about it? So multilateralism is not only dying, and, and I'm really sorry to say it, is not only dying from uh, the US administ administration side, but also from the EU side. Um, and the third point was about 1933 and 1934 and the, the comparison um, with the interwar period. I think the most dangerous point today is, um, and that's more about the US, but maybe also about Europe, I'm not sure, was that if you compare the current situation with 1933 and 1934 in Austria, the first thing that uh, Mr. Dolfus, who became um, the leader of Austria at that time, did was to put newspapers under censorship. And we are coming back to your point that local news is so important, or news in general and newspapers are so important. Um, some people have the impression that there is no real open discussion on, on for example, corona. And, and um, that might be a comparison to the interwar period. The newspapers are self-censoring themselves. Shall, shall I repeat it or do you? If I may start on this, maybe, maybe <laughs> because it was very close to my conviction. Also, I, I, I have very similar feeling that Today, we have mainly domestic policy and not foreign policy. Yes, also in the case of Belarus, I would like to compare situation when started crisis in Ukraine. Maybe you remember in this time we sent as uh, 
Foreign Affairs Council ministries from Brussels, we send ministries to Kiev, uh, Steinmeier and French minister and uh, uh, Polish minister to Kiev. It was, this mission was probably unsuccessful. But what seems to me interesting that we send ministries to negotiate, to deal, to use diplomacy. Now, in the case of Belarus, there is no diplomacy. We are only starting with the sanctions. Uh, it seems to me very characteristic. That you, you said that now we have only domestic policy, no foreign policy. Because my feeling is that you are able to solve any similar problem if you are able really to make sometimes risky diplomacy steps and be able to also accept some compromises. Why in, 90, in, uh, why in 1968 they had no chance in Czech Republic, in Czechoslovakia with this? Because there was no, no diplomacy between US and, and Russia in this time. Why we were successful in 1989, Velvet Revolution? because it was absolutely different situation. And from Russia, there was some diplomacy between United States, current president and uh, Gorbachev in this time. There was some communication, there was some uh, steps. And this diplomacy was created room in which Velvet Revolution was possible. But it was relatively clear that probably Russia will not intervene. A Czechoslovak country we got the chance to create independent regime. You know, uh, in this time, this diplomacy between powers also created room for countries like Czechoslovakia to start new life and to be independent countries. And now when I follow situation in Belarus, we have many examples. In the, you can take Venezuela, for example, this attempt, people in the street. Egypt, also people in the street. But you have, there is no follow-up after this, because there is no diplomacy. I am afraid of one thing, if we on the West are raising false expectations because we are making declarations, because we are making, maybe making decisions about sanctions. But what are the real impacts of these steps if these steps are not, uh, not followed or, or part of some also diplomatic attempts, maybe risky steps, but steps which will create room for some solution in these countries. And I am afraid if we have no idea and no they are making no attempt to communicate with other partners. That's, I am very, I have problem if, if there is a real room, for example, in Belarusia really to change something. I am, I am, I, I met, I remember that years ago I, I met, I, I have many meetings with the current Minister of Foreign Affairs, Belarus. Also I, in Minsk, I met Lukashenko. I remember this, uh, this meeting, uh, Lukashenko told me that he is expecting that in short time Putin under some pretext will intervene in Belarus because he wants to create military bases in Belarus. He told me Belarus is the last country without military bases if you take any post-Soviet countries as Georgia, Ukraine and so. And uh, in, in, some t in, in, this, in, in this time really it was some position of Lukashenko in foreign policy to keep Belarus without, be, without concrete intervention of military. So now things are changing, but uh, because now it seems that Lukashenko is much more, much more under the influence of uh, Putin and is losing ground in, in Belarus. On the other hand, it seems to me if really we want to help Belarus, it's impossible without diplomacy. And I am afraid that we are not willing to start this diplomacy because it's risky. It's very difficult to address Putin. Probably we have limited cards. But in similar situation, I'm really afraid of uh, false expectation which we can create in, in, in this situation. But generally, I agree what you said. We are facing what we have now is very, very often only domestic policy, not foreign policy. 
and the European Union resignate on, on, resignate on, on, on real foreign policy. And we can speak why. Uh, it, it is the same like in, in US. America First is also a program for domestic policy, not for US foreign, pol foreign policy. It's, 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 it's my feeling. And maybe also last, what I would like is also to, on this different question of uh, COVID. Uh, my, my feeling is that uh, speaking about behavior of government, what is very important if country which uh, is relatively democratic country is able to, to behave effectively. It's now there is something like uh, 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 there are many comparisons in current world. It's very important if democratic countries are willing, are, are able, are strong enough to manage this uh, epidemic crisis. B because this is something which is on the end of all stories. If you are effective to be able to fight epidemic, maybe, and uh, it's very important that democratic countries are able to be effective. Because in opposite, uh, democracy will be losing. Maybe I would like to say that it seems to me that in the last 15 years, democracy is losing in, in current world. We have more and more failed states like Yemen and Lebanon maybe and so. Uh, democracy is really uh, in defeating uh, in, 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 la in last years. And it seems to me that in this crisis is very important to show that democratic countries are effective. They are able to, 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 to find right answers. Uh, it's a very important fight and the result will be also very important. I'll pick, out a few, I'll pick out a few things. You've all been very patient. It's like it's the first time you've been allowed out of your apartments in months. And <laughs> you know, e Even this is entertaining enough to keep you in the room. That's, that's very nice. Um, on, the, on the prophecy, I just want to resist the word prophecy. I want, to make clear what I, I want to make clear that I think what happens in the US depends a great deal on what people do between now and November 3rd. So when I was trying to say, European reporters, please be aware that we don't have to know the results on November 3rd, I'm trying to affect what happens between now and November 3rd. And there are a lot of other people who are trying to affect what happens between now and November 3rd. So I don't wanna give Mr. Trump powers that he doesn't actually have. I wanna I want make, make it hard for him. It is clear though that he's going to dispute the results even if he wins. I mean, he won last time and he still disputed the results. So, he, and he's announced over and over that he's gonna dispute the results. So that, that we can be pretty sure about. On the European Union, uh, I mean, I haven't been here you know, for more than a few weeks during this pandemic, but I do know that the European Council on Foreign Relations carried out a poll of every European Union member state. And I was interested to see that 62% of Europeans believed that the pandemic was a reason to advance European integration. And that's interesting because Europeans basically don't think anything is a reason to advance European integration. If you ask them, come up with something that's a reason to advance European integration, they would be like, hmm. But interestingly, a clear majority of Europeans thought, at least as of July, that the pandemic was a reason to favor the European Union. And I, I take that as a sign for cautious, for cautious optimism. And then with respect to Belarus and to foreign policy and domestic policy, I'm just gonna repeat the point I made earlier, which is that you don't really have a domestic policy unless you have a foreign policy and vice, and vice versa, especially if we're talking about d d d democracy. So, I mean, moving towards your concerns, Mr. Ambassador, I think it doesn't matter so much whether you win in Belarus. It does matter a lot whether you have a position on, on, on Belarus because the question that you raise, like, what is the long-term effect? You know, will we maybe be nudging Putin this way or that way? That argument can be made both ways. But what, will, what is certain is w whether you take a position or not. That's certain. Um, that's one thing which is clear. I, I, I happen to disagree, I think, with the analysis because what's happening now is that because the Americans are absent, um, which is unusual in this sort of thing. 
Um, and the Europeans are not very active. There is no, you know, there's no Sikorsky, there, there's nobody going to Minsk right now. No, there is Sikorsky, but he's in Brussels, right? He's no longer Polish foreign minister. Um, but, uh, but there is no European presence. And I'd like to agree very much with the minister's remarks about diplomacy. Because there isn't a European presence, we're, you're, you're drifting towards the scenario that you describe, I think, which is that the Russians, who are very disoriented, did not expect this, and don't really know what to do, are winning anyway. Because there's no one else in, in, in the room. And so, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm afraid that what's happening is, 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 is what you describe, but for different reasons. I don't think and here is where I respectfully disagree, I don't think you can push Lukashenko towards Putin because Lukashenko no longer has the domestic legitimacy that he had before these elections. He is now, for the first time, I think, actually dependent upon Putin, but not because of anything you did, but because of the, what the Belarusians did, which is they voted him out of office. He's lost an election. I mean, as, as people should, I think, more clearly say, he lost. And when you lose, you're supposed to go. So, and that's, I think, something that you know, we should agree about. He lost, he should, he should go. It's really not very complicated. And I think that what, you know, what Europeans can do is move in on that principle. Not that we're for or against Lukashenko or for or against Putin, but that, we're, that we would like to help. If the majority of Belarusians want there to be clean elections, we would like, we would like to help with that. And, I, I, and with Putin, I think here one has to be very careful because I think his position is much closer to Lukashenko's um, than it appears. I mean, he, you know, speaking of protests, you know, there have been protests going on in Habarovsk for months now, also on a question of, of basically of democracy. Putin's approval ratings are, are half of what they were two years ago, um, he faces really serious problems. And so I don't think, you know, I think Europeans can get into this habit, you know, which Mr. Trump does too, of thinking, okay, there's a dictator, therefore he's there forever. But, you know, we can't, we're, we're, what, one thing which is not gonna happen is that we push Lukashenko over to Putin for the next 20 years, because, and here I will prophesize, um, Putin and Lukashenko are not gonna be in power in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> they will probably not be alive. <laughs> so, um, so, but again, I think the, the, more, the most important thing with Belarus and Europe actually I think has to do with Europe rather than, rather than with Belarus. And, and to answer your direct question, I think in addition to what the minister said about there being a diplomatic presence, I think there should be positive incentives and not just sanctions. Namely, I think the European Union should say, if Belarus succeeds in having a clean election, we will allow for the free and unimpeded travel of Belarusians inside the European Union. Why not? You know, if you're so sure that if you're so sure they can't do it, then you're not making any risks. And if they do it, why not allow Belarusians to travel in the European Union? Ukrainians can travel in the European Union. There aren't that many Belarusians. You know, about as many. You know, as, as, I, won't, I won't mention any countries by name, but about as many as there are in other East European countries. Why not? Why not create not just sanctions, but a positive incentive and say, you know, we will have, we'll allow free movement and we will begin discussions on an association agreement with Belarus. Why not? Why not? Why not create a positive incentive? Why not have an actual, an actual foreign policy? And then, which leads us to this, the question about protests, and, and you're quite right, um, you're quite right in there, that, that it's in these, it's, there's a middle zone of countries where the the dictator or the aspiring dictator denies the reality of the virus where you then get a bunch of protests. And that's, that's Brazil, that's also Russia incidentally, um, and it's the United States of America and it's, and it's Belarus, where you have this dynamic that you can't say, hey, don't protest because it's a, um, but, and, and I do think, I think you're right, I think, I think your analysis is, is correct. And then if it's about the science, I'm just gonna point out that it does seem like being outdoors is pretty is very safe, almost regardless of what you do when you're outdoors. Um, and I, I I agree with your concern that the more technocratic part of the European elite can use can use the pandemic to argue that they don't don't protest. And I think in the you know in the very long run, or in even the middle run, or not even in the middle run, forever. Um, what's happened in the U.S. and in Russia and in Belarus and all over the world shows us that you can't have democracy without an active public. Um, and this feeds into the local news question and the digitalization question and China, right? The one thing, 
Um, I was talking to a journalist from Hong Kong the other day, and she asked me if, journal if, if the dictatorships around the world were learning from each other. And I said, it's hard to say whether they're learning from each other because there seems to be a total lack of imagination everywhere. Right? Like if you read out a Trump response to a protest, a Putin response to a protest, and a, and a Chinese response to a protest, they all say it was inspired by foreigners, it's a threat to our sovereignty, right? They say exactly the same things, right? There's no, there's no imagination at all in the response, which leads me to think that the protest itself is the essential thing. Like it's the protest itself which is what bothers these people. It's, it's, the, it's the physical appearance on, on, on the streets. And so I, I agree and you know, I, I, think, I think the science is actually on my side. I mean the reason why the Americans are dying is that they stay inside in, in air-conditioned spaces and go to bars and so on in air-conditioned spaces. Everything, I think being outside is generally fine. There was a lot of worry about the Black Lives Matter protests along these lines and it hasn't actually panned out. Um, protesting outside seems to, be, seems to be fine, so do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very glad that we ended on a positive note. <laughs> call, for, call for action, some might call it. Uh, I, th I believe we have heard many interesting thoughts and many and much food for thought. Uh, but uh, it's time to end this part of the evening. So uh, please uh, join me in thanking our uh, excellent speakers for the evening. And uh, And thank you again for audience for coming to this evening and uh, the Embassy and the Institute for Human Sciences for organizing this, uh, this interesting event. And as you, as you suspect, there is an informal continuation, so you, you can slowly continue in, in the discussion later on. Thank you again.